Kaku Sensei Negima debuted in Weekly Shonen Magazine in February of 2003. The series was written and illustrated by Ken Akamatsu, who at the time was best known for his popular series Love Hina. Over the course of its nine-year run, Negima produced 355 chapters of manga, spanning 38 volumes. The series was adapted into two 26-episode anime, multiple OVAs, and even spawned a sequel manga, which was then adapted into its own anime. In 2005, the first Negima anime was produced. Like many of its time, the series was cheap, poorly animated, and frequently made changes to the source material. More recent fans of anime may not realize how common this was, but back in the day, a lot of adaptations got their own original endings. While this may still happen today, it's far less frequent, especially as more and more series make it to a second season based on the interest of the US market. Anime original endings can go either way. Some, like Full Metal Alchemist's first series, are still quality and, in some regards, might actually be better than the original. Negama is not one of these series. The problem with anime original endings is that they must often guess the direction a series is headed in while it is still incomplete. This is especially bad in the case of a series like Negama, where the adaptation only covers the first three or so volumes, dipping slightly into volumes four through six for the following arc. But for a series that would go on to last 38 volumes, and vastly change in scope and direction, there was no way to predict how things would turn out. Despite this, there are still anime fans out there who have only ever known Negama as the pair of adaptations it's received. Many are content to write it off as your typical harem series, an aimless shitty rom-com in the vein of Love Hina. I believe that this does a disservice to a series as fun and imaginative as Negama. And so over the course of this video, I will try to explain to you why you should read the fucking manga. The story of Negama revolves around Negi Springfield, a Welsh 10-year-old who is arriving in Japan to become a middle school English teacher. Why is a 10-year-old becoming an English teacher in Japan, you ask? Well, aside from the fact that teaching English in Japan is incredibly easy and you basically just have to be a native speaker of English, he's also a mage who has just graduated from magic school back in Wales. Over the course of the first few chapters, we're introduced to Negi's class as well as some of the other teachers that Negi will be working with. We also get a bit of a sense of Negi's personality. He's very shy, he's incredibly formal, and the only person he really seems to let his guard down around is Takahata-sensei, a teacher that it's implied he has an existing relationship with. Takahata-sensei is also the object of one of Negi's students' affections. Asuna, who runs into Negi on his first day and pretty much establishes herself immediately as the bitchy Naru Narusagawa clone for this particular series, has a huge crush on Takahata-sensei, and after finding out that Negi is a mage, she blackmails him into trying to help her get his love. This is a common theme in the first 30 or so chapters of Negima, is Asuna trying to get Takahata-sensei's attention and trying to get Negi to help, and then something goes horribly wrong, usually involving comedic fan service. The rest of the early parts of Negima also kind of follow the same general trend. Usually, something will happen with Negi, all of the students will misunderstand the situation and assume things, spread rumors, hijinks ensue, lots of fan service, and then at the end the truth comes out and everything goes back to normal. We also get a decent number of chapters introducing the many characters of Negi's class. After all, Negi has a class of 30 students, and at the start of the series, all we really get to know about them is a little note in the class ledger that usually is a reference to what club they're in. The remainder of the chapters tend to follow the plot of Negi trying to prevent people from finding out he's a mage. Because, if you let people find out about the magical world, the punishment is you get turned into an ermine. What is an ermine, you ask? Well, it's a cute, ferret-like weasel thing. Why is that what they turn people into? Oh. Well, but considering the best character in the series is an ermine, and he doesn't seem particularly affected by the fact that he's an ermine, it doesn't seem that bad. Luckily, things in Negima don't stay this way for long. Over time, we learn about Negi's drive to become a Magister Magi, the most powerful class of wizard. This is because his father was the legendary Thousand Master. A Magister Magi is said to know a thousand spells, and one so powerful he didn't need any disciples to support him. These disciples, known as partners, 
gain increased physical ability and a unique artifact by forming a pact with their mage. This is honestly one of my favorite parts of Negima. Uh, I would liken it to something like the stands in JoJo, in that each character through this unique artifact has the potential to get some very interesting and cool ability. On top of that, the design of the artifacts and the kind of costume and character design that goes into these upgraded forms of each character is a lot of fun to get to see, and is often based on their personality. Negi's relationship with his father, including the parallels and contrasts between the two of them, become even more apparent as we move into the first real conflict of the series, Ava. One of Negi's students, Evangeline A.K. McDowell, is revealed to be a vampire, one who has been attacking students during the full moon. And through fighting her, Negi discovers that she is an old enemy of his father, who he imprisoned at Mahora, forcing her to repeat middle school over and over and over again. Clearly a fate worse than death. This arc, while short, is still the first time Negima really starts to set itself apart from being just a generic harem comedy. Things take more than one or two chapters to wrap up. Negi must confront his own weaknesses and improve himself, and the characters and relationships between them start to grow and develop more than just a single dimension. One such character is Asuna, who starts to move out of her bitchy, sundere, generic, I'm gonna punch and yell at the main character because of misunderstandings type of role, and move into the role that she occupies more for the rest of the series, as sort of a big sister figure and more of a benevolent protector for Negi. Asuna becomes Negi's first partner. She gains a boost to strength and speed, and the artifact that she gets is a giant fan, which later becomes a sword. We also find out that Asuna appears to have an ability to dispel magic, something that seems to be innate within her, and not intrinsically linked with her artifact. This hints at a little bit of depth of the character that goes beyond just the standard high school student that she seems to be. The Ava arc is also significantly more combat-oriented than the series had been thus far, and it includes a decent amount of world-building. While fan service and tropey romance is still very much a part of things, and would continue to be till the end of the series, this is the first time we really get a sense of where things may be starting to go. This is even more well demonstrated in what would come next, the Kyoto arc. The Kyoto arc sees Negi and his class going to Kyoto for a school trip. Negi has been tasked to deliver a letter to the Kansai mages to prevent conflict with the Kanto mages. While there are still comedic elements, the arc is mostly combat focused. There are some interesting antagonists, one of which is incredibly important and becomes a major character for the remainder of the series. Plus, more students find out that Negi is a mage, which gives a lot more options for creative character interaction. So here's the thing. The Kyoto arc is pretty good. It's, it's honestly like the first really good arc for Negima, and it only gets better from there. How does the anime handle this? The bulk of the Kyoto arc in the anime is two episodes. Two episodes. They cut so much out of this arc. Oh sure, there's elements from the arc that are kind of recontextualized and put in as their own separate episodes before the arc. There's elements from after the arc that get recontextualized and put in before the arc. But just so much that happens is not in here. One of the biggest and most detrimental changes they made was removing the character of Kotaro. Kotaro starts off as an antagonist, but he ends up becoming Negi's best friend. They're about the same age. They have some of the same interests, they end up being kind of friendly rivals. He's basically Negi's Vegeta, and he's there for the rest of the series as an important ally, and he's just completely cut. Not in the anime. Cut for time. I mean, I guess, like, they, they couldn't know, obviously, that he was going to end up becoming so important, but it just seems really short-sighted to take such a important and honestly quality arc and then just cut it completely down. The Library Island arc, which amounts to nothing. They're just going under this giant library to find a book that makes them smarter to pass a test. That arc gets more episodes than the Kyoto arc in this anime. <sighs> All of that aside, the first anime, the 2005 anime, up until this point has pretty much followed the manga. There have been some small changes, there have been some, some things cut for time, but for the most part, it's pretty consistent. 
However, after this point is when we get into the anime original ending, the original content that was made specifically for the anime. And we'll tackle that in a bit. But for now, let's look at how the anime stacks up as an adaptation. Is it a good representation of what's in the manga? Is it worth watching? Is it worth your time? Short answer, no. Professor Takahata, no one else's hot job. Be my homeroom teacher. Hey, Asuna. <laughs> okay, long answer. There are certain elements about a adaptation that can make it transformative, that can make it worthwhile to watch. They'll add something that the manga doesn't have. This can be music, this can be quality animation, this could be voice acting, but there are many things that an anime has that a manga can't. Does the 2005 Negama anime include any of these things? Not really. The colors are pretty flat and unappealing, they're just general pastel colors. The animation is bland and not particularly exciting, there isn't really any interesting cinematography or adventurous ways of editing or putting everything together. The music is the same four or five MIDI tracks over every single scene. Is it a comedic scene? Get used to hearing this one. The book of Jason the Frower, Spring King. Jason the Frower was born on the branch of a tall tree. And the voice acting, well that depends on if you're watching the dub, or if you're watching the sub. So in terms of the Japanese cast, they're alright. Uh, I know a lot of people will make the argument that it's impossible to tell the quality of a voice acting performance in a foreign language, but I honestly find that to be untrue. While yes, I may not have the ability to tell if a voice actor is getting their lines out properly or missing specific inflections, I think it's not an insurmountable task to gauge the emotion put into a line reading, and if it fits the tone of the scene. There's also the matter of proper casting. There can be a lot of leeway in this, but I'm not going to accept Norio Wakamoto's voice coming out of Negi's mouth. So So I can't be too judgmental, but overall, the Japanese cast seems to do a decent job, nothing is extremely out of place or distracting, and that's enough for me. The English dub, on the other hand, that's a different story. Most of the girls are alright. <laughs> if he thinks as soon as that in English lit, he should fear an algebra class. And economics. And science and history. You girls are being too rough on her. As soon as actually quite good in PE. Hey! Not great. Tell us where you're from. Speak up. Well, I was born in Wales. I love the ocean! Wales, England. Hey, you must be really smart. But all right. But no one is especially good. But what about our main character? Hold it! Get away from her, you evil creature! No! Yep. They decided to go with British accents. Are you nuts? I thought we agreed on this. I have to believe in him, Anya with non-British actors. This island is the farthest east you can go. Try to run any farther and you'll have to swim. Who can't do British accents. Oh nice, you look grey love, top of the line. <laughs> I'll kill you! I'll drain you of every last drop! While also doing the most annoying voice the actor could possibly manage. Wait! Don't do it! Just back away! Oh, not again, girls! Please stop! Oh, don't worry about them, Professor. <laughs> you guys had better not fight each other, or else I'll be unhappy. Okay, that's enough of that. The dub is really not worth the pain. Don't watch it. So yeah, there's really nothing in this adaptation that the manga doesn't have that makes the adaptation worth watching. So with that out of the way, let's take a look at the anime original ending. The one thing that the anime has that the manga doesn't. I'm not sure why this decision was made by Zebek to make a anime original ending. I don't know if they never intended to give the show a second season. Maybe second seasons were just much more unlikely at that time. Uh, I don't know, but the series was popular enough to get a spinoff and several OVA continuations over its run. So it's not as if nobody was interested, but I digress. I remember the first time I watched this series, which was over 10 years ago, which, oh my god, what the fuck am I doing with my life? 
But I remember being surprised at just how out of nowhere the ending was. We get a few episodes of Asuna acting very strange. She seems down, she keeps alluding to not being around much longer, she even confesses to Takahata. Anyone who knows the warning signs of suicide knows that tying up loose ends and giving away all of their things is a pretty big red flag. Despite this, Negi sees she's marked a day on her calendar and realizes that it's her birthday soon, so they should have a party. Despite an earlier episode showing Negi and Konoka buying a gift for her birthday, like 10 episodes ago? Did they give her a birthday present super early? Has a full year passed without any indication? Does it really matter? It doesn't really matter. So the party happens and it's all weird and melancholic and finally Negi and Asuna end up at the World Tree with Asuna super depressed. Negi tries to ask her what's wrong but she still refuses to tell him. The clock strikes midnight and Asuna dies. End of episode. Start of next episode. First thing we see, her funeral. Then she's cremated. Upon rewatching this, I literally burst out laughing when this happened. It was so abrupt. A lot of shows will end on a death or a tragedy in one episode, and then the next they'll start sometime later, showing how other characters have been affected and alluding to events that happened in the interim. They don't just cut straight to the funeral and cremate the body. Negi literally takes the charred, melted hairpiece that Asuna always wears and keeps it. The series just gets so dour, minus some really out-of-place comedy. We're literally treated to a full episode of everyone moping about Asuna's death, and Negi goes fucking insane trying to bring her back. Over the next few episodes, we find out Asuna was dealing with a demon? Like, she kept attracting monsters, and so because of that, she makes a deal with a demon that gives her magic cancel powers or something. But... This deal also put an expiration date on her 10 years later. So she made the deal when she was 5, so when she turns 15 on her birthday, she dies. Okay. Uh, after brooding for a whole episode, and at one point literally trying to sell his soul to a demon, Negi turns to the power of science to bring Asuna back. He ends up getting a magic time-traveling watch from Chao, who is a way more important character in the next arc that never gets adapted, like, anywhere. And actually, the cool time-traveling watch also is a major part of the next arc, which also never got adapted, which is kind of sad. So yeah, this whole section is totally, totally inconsistent. We go from sad to zany hijinks, back to sad, back to zany hijinks. Ugh, it's not good. So Negi goes back in time, accidentally bringing the whole class with him, and ends up in Germany ten years in the past. Negi finds Asuna, who is traveling with his father. Nagi explains Asuna's backstory to Negi, and Negi stays with them for a day or two before they are attacked by a monster, which kills Nagi. Or at least makes him disappear. Because Nagi, the legendary Thousand Master of unlimited magical power, Forgot the little girl he's been traveling with and protecting because she has a magic cancel ability, has a magic cancel ability that nullifies his barrier and gets him killed. Negi takes Nagi's place as Asuna's protector and explains to his students that magic is real. They get attacked by a bunch of demons, including the demon that Asuna made a deal with. The entire class contracts with Negi and they all fight off and kill the demons. This is actually my favorite part about this anime original ending because at least it adds something interesting. Uh, the contracts have always been one of my favorite parts of the series, so I'm a sucker for unique abilities that are related to a character's personality. And whether it be stands, quirks, anything like that, uh, it's usually pretty fun to see. Plus, because the characters of Negima don't start off with their artifacts, it gives a little bit of time to, based on their personality, try to theorize about what their artifact might be, what kind of powers it might have, before we're inevitably disappointed. I do like to see the designs they came up with for this final fight, especially because Akamatsu himself actually consulted on a few of them. So after the fight, they go back to the future and have the party again. Eventually, they use the World Tree to break Asuna's contract with the demon or whatever, and I don't really care at this point. So that's the anime original ending for Negima. Is it bad? Well, yeah, it's pretty terrible. Is it as bad as the ending in the manga? Nothing will ever be as bad as the ending to the manga, but we'll get to that. Honestly, the biggest problem I have with this ending is it's unnecessary. 
They knew the series was ongoing. They had the Kyoto arc to work with and they cut it down to two episodes so they could spend four whole episodes on an original ending? They even included the Time Watch, an element from the first truly good arc in the series. Why did they not just fill out the end of the season with the Kyoto arc and leave things open to adapt more in a later season? Then again, with how poorly this adaptation was done, maybe it was a good thing they didn't get their hands on the rest of the series. I don't know. At this point, I don't care. The Negama anime is bad. Don't watch it. Before moving into the manga, I feel like it's appropriate to take a look at the other adaptations of Negama. Despite the blandness of the 2005 Zebek anime, the other series actually range from decent to pretty damn good. I've been using clips from them sparingly throughout the video, which should have been apparent from the blatant change in art style and quality, but I actually want to take a moment to focus on them here. One quick disclaimer before I get into the meat of things. See this? This is not Negima. It looks like Negima. The name is something like Negima, but this is not Negima. Uh, this is actually the spin-off series for Negima. While it was under the guidance of Ken Akamatsu, the series was actually written by Takuya Fujima, and it really doesn't bear much resemblance at all to the actual Negima series. The anime adaptation was done by Shaft, it was actually directed by Akiyuki Shinbo, but it takes a completely different track. Uh, it's completely over the top weird zaniness. There's a whole bunch of like weird side characters they add in. Uh, Negi's older sister slash cousin whatever shows up and she's very different in this than she would be uh, turn out to be in the actual main series. It's just a whole bucket of weird and uh, personally, upon re-watching this to make this video, I actually ended up liking it more than I did originally. Uh, something about the kind of the weird sense of humor uh, made me laugh a little more than the first time around that I watched it. I think maybe because I've been able to detach this from the main series now more than I did way the hell back when it first came out. But I would only really recommend this to somebody that has already read the whole manga, that's read the spin-off manga, that really likes the series and just wants to see some kind of weird thing done with the characters. So... If you haven't read Negima, and if you're not already a fan, I would probably steer clear of this. Okay, with that out of the way, moving on. There are two primary OVA series that actually act as a continuation of the Negima story. Strangely, both of these adaptations were handled by Shaft. Despite the fact that until this point, the only real involvement Shaft had with the series was the non-canon spinoff. The first of the two is the Ala Alba OVAs. These cover the period of time just after the end of the school festival arc. Because of course, we'll never see that animated. And are presented in a sort of an omnibus format. They actually cover a decent amount of chapters, but because they mostly focus on the in-between time between two major arcs, we don't really get much in the way of excitement beyond one or two minutes of the final battle of the festival arc. The Ala Alba OVA basically covers a training arc preceding the longest and most critical arc of the series. As such, it's mostly limited to exposition and shenanigans, which is a little weird considering it sort of exists in an adaptationless void. Couple that with the fact that the OVA is sort of a direct adaptation, sometimes panel for panel, of the manga, but it leaves out a lot of the connective tissue between events, so someone who hasn't actually read the manga might be left a little confused. All in all, I would recommend it as a companion piece to the manga, but not something to go in with on your first time. But because of where it lies in the timeline, it does sort of dovetail well into the next OVA. The second of the OVA series covers the beginning of the Magical World arc. The five episodes span the early events of the Magical World arc, with the final episode being a side story centering around Yue. These episodes were done by Shaft, and they're on the whole pretty great. The action is exciting, the art and animation are brilliant, and there's even some really creative visual direction mixed in. These episodes came out slowly over the course of a year or so, so I only ever watched them here or there as they were being released, and because of that, I remember them as being a lot more disjointed and leaving parts out. It wasn't until I started working on this video that I went back and watched them all in a row. And I've gotta say, they definitely hold up and work a lot better as a whole. They can be pretty well understood without filling in the minor gaps left by the adaptation. 
watching the Mohitotsu Seikai OVAs really makes me wish that the whole series had gotten a full adaptation, in this vein rather than what we got. I honestly think someone interested in the series could give these a watch with somewhat of a cursory knowledge of what the series is about and get something out of it. While I haven't tried it myself, this OVA could be a good way for someone to try out the series and see where it eventually starts to go to see if Negum was something they might enjoy. The final adaptation that the core series of Negumo received was in the form of a movie in 2011. This movie was also produced by Shaft and covers the final chapters of the manga while delivering an actual ending to the series. Something the manga never quite did. This movie isn't bad, but I found it to be kind of a letdown. It skims over adapting the ending chapters of the series and spends the bulk of its runtime dealing with events that happen after the final battle. Unfortunately, there's a lot of faffing about, and even in the end, things resolve with a lot of room for more that just could have been done. It's certainly well made, and I would recommend it to someone that's finished the manga, but I prefer the developments brought forth in Negima's sequel series, UQ Holder, over what's here. <sighs> oh boy. So this turned out to be way longer than I was expecting. Uh, I thought this was going to be like 40 minutes at most, but we're like halfway done right now and we're about to hit the 30 minute mark. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to split this into two separate episodes. The first episode, this one, is mainly focusing on the anime, the adaptations, and what's available. The next episode is going to focus specifically on the manga, what goes unadapted, what are the good and bad aspects of Negima as a series. I think it's a little more manageable to have it in two parts, especially when they're kind of separate in the ideas behind them. And also, if you're like me and you like to go back and watch videos over and over again because you have nothing else to do with your time, I think it might be easier to have them kind of split so that people can go back and watch one or the other if that's what they prefer. I am going to upload both episodes as a unit, so part two should be already up if you're watching this now. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you in part two.